let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer, and we'll get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our Father, we come before you once again tonight in all humility, as your sons and as your daughters, adopted into the Trinitarian life by the power of the Holy Spirit, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we meditate upon this great mystery of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and particularly tonight, the real and substantial presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the Most Holy Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament. May we fall more deeply in love with you tonight, Father, as we meditate upon this truth. May we see your love manifested in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. May we see and come to experience Christ's love. And ultimately, in the end, as we walk out tonight, may the Holy Eucharist no longer become an idea or some abstract thought. But may our encounter with the Holy Eucharist truly be an encounter with whom it is, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. All you holy apostles, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so... Last week we left off, I tell you what, it's felt so long, it seems like forever since I've been here since last week, going to Moses Lake three days in a row like that, it feels like an eternity since I've been here, but it's only been a week, it's an amazing thing. Uh, but last week we left off with our reflection, we had a reflection on the Mass as the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, looking at the Mass as the one transcendent sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, which eternally exists exists before the Father in heaven in an unbloody manner, is made present on every altar every time we go to Mass. So, let me ask you, this past Sunday, based upon our reflection last week on the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ, how was your experience of Mass? Did anything click? Any, any, anybody have an aha moment last week <laughs> as we're going through Mass realizing that this is the sacrifice of Christ? We're there to worship, we're there to adore, and to offer Him our love. Amen? Tonight, as we complete our biblical blueprint for the Mass, constructing this biblical blueprint, we're going to look at the biblical revelation of the real and substantial presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. We're going to look at passages primarily such as John chapter 6 and the Bread of Life Discourse where Jesus Christ says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we're going to ask and answer the very fundamental question, did Jesus Christ mean that language, use those words metaphorically or did he use them in literally and intend them to be taken literally? Then we're going to go to the Last Supper. And then we're going to look at the words of institution. We're going to ask the very same question. Are the words of institution to be taken metaphorically or literally? And then we're going to complete our study tonight by looking at St. Paul's theology on the Holy Eucharist. Asking the question, how did Paul understand the words of the Last Supper? Does Paul think that the Eucharist is merely a symbol of Jesus? And that Jesus used those words metaphorically at the Last Supper? Or does Paul believe that the Eucharist is really Jesus Christ? So, that's a brief outline of our reflection tonight. The Bread of Life Discourse, the Last Supper, then Paul's Theology. Before we jump into the Bread of Life Discourse, what I want to start with is the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Very often... We go right into the Bread of Life discourse, start talking about Jesus' command to eat his flesh and drink his blood. However, the event that precedes that Bread of Life discourse is Jesus' multiplication of the loaves, of the five loaves and the two fishes. Five loaves feeding over 5,000 men, not including women and children, 
And there's something there in that miracle. John records that particular miracle right before the Bread of Life discourse. So there must be something in the miracle that is meant to prepare us for and teach us about the Eucharist. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church actually affirms this. The Catechism states, the miracles of the multiplication of the loaves, when the Lord says the blessing breaks and distributes the loaves through his disciples to feed the multitude, prefigure the superabundance of this unique bread of his Eucharist. So notice how the catechism affirms that this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves prefigures the Eucharist. So what I want to ask tonight is how? How does this miracle point us to and prepare us for the Eucharist? Amen? So that's our first concept or our first topic of discussion tonight. So the first question is, how does this miracle point us to the Eucharist? I'm going to give you four clues. There are four clues in this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves that point us to the Holy Eucharist. So four clues for a Eucharistic symbolism, you might say, or a Eucharistic interpretation, or a Eucharistic overtone of this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Our first clue is John's usage of the Greek word Eucharistin. When John records Jesus taking the loaves and he, what, gave thanks, the Greek word that is used there for giving thanks is Eucharistin. From which we get the English word, what? Eucharist. Okay? Now, not only do we see that how this word points us to the Eucharist, because we get the word Eucharist from it, but what I'm going to show you is how this particular Greek word in the Christian tradition of the first and second century had Eucharistic overtones to it. It was used in reference to the Eucharist. It was used in reference to the breaking of the bread of the first century Christians. For example, we have a document called the Didache, which simply is the teaching of the Twelve. The teaching of the Twelve. And this dates to anywhere from 70 to 90 AD. And here's what the Didache states. This is a real historical document, extra biblical writing, not inspired by God, but true history. And here's what it states. Now about the Eucharist, the Greek word, eucharistias. The root there is eucharisteo. Same thing as eucharistin, okay? So now about the Eucharist. This is how we give thanks. Same root word there, eucharisteo. First in connection with the cup, then in connection with the piece broken off the loaf. You must not let anyone eat or drink of your Eucharist, eucharistias there, except those baptized in the Lord's name. End quote. So notice how this early historical Christian document, in reference to the Last Supper, the Greek word that's used is Eucharistian, at least in root form. So this is a word in the Christian tradition in first century Christianity, 70 to 90 AD, that's used in reference to the Eucharist. Here's another example. Oh yeah, by the way, just as a side note, notice how all the way from the early beginnings of Christianity, it was understood that one could not partake of the Eucharist unless they were first baptized. Okay? So notice that this idea of being baptized, then partaking of the other sacraments, the Eucharist, confession, etc., dates all the way back to the first century of Christianity, 70 to 90 AD. Another example in early Christianity, where Eucharistin or Eucharisteo uh, is used in reference to the Eucharist. The next quote comes from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who writes in 107 AD, only seven years after John the Apostle died, Ignatius would have known John, would have heard John. Ignatius of Antioch, tradition has it, is the third successor to St. Peter as the Bishop of Antioch. 
the second, excuse me, the second successor to Peter, third bishop of Antioch. Peter was first bishop in Antioch before he went to Rome. But the, um, Ignatius was the second successor to Peter as the bishop of Antioch. And tradition has it Peter actually ordained St. Ignatius. So St. Ignatius would have heard the preaching of the apostles, still having that preaching ringing in his mind, in his ears, when he's writing in 107 AD. And here's what he writes. They hold aloof from the Eucharist. The root Greek word there, Eucharisteo, same root that, of that word John's using for the breaking of the bread and the multiplication of the loaves, Eucharistin. They hold aloof from the Eucharist. Why? Because they refuse to admit that the Eucharist, root word, Eucharisteo, is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, end quote. Do you think he was Catholic, folks? Yes! Notice in 107 A.D., St. Ignatius writing about the Eucharist, Eucharisteo, being the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. Now, here's the conclusion. When we come to John, John's writing his gospel in about 90 AD. Okay? 90 to 100 AD. And he's using this Greek word, Eucharistin, to give thanks for the multiplication of the loaves. Amen? That Greek word, and he's writing and using that Greek word within the same time frame where that same Greek word is used in the Didache and St. Ignatius of Antioch in reference to the Eucharist. So when John uses this Greek word Eucharistin, what would be coming to mind for Christians of that day? The Eucharist. They would be thinking Last Supper. They would, be, they would come across that word Eucharistin. Yeah, that's from our Christian tradition. We know what that word used for. It's commonly referred to the Last Supper in the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread. And so in light of this Greek word, in the multiplication of the loaves used by St. John, it points to the Last Supper, the Eucharist. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, as I just said, uh, okay, so we see that Eucharisteo is used in the Didache and in St. Ignatius of Antioch, extra-biblical writings. We can further demonstrate how this Greek word used by John in the multiplication of the loaves points to the Eucharist, the Last Supper, because that same Greek word is used by the Gospel authors. At least Matthew and Mark, they use Eucharisteo in reference to the cup of wine. When Jesus took the cup of wine, changed it into his blood, and gave thanks. Luke and Paul use this Greek word, Eucharisteo, in reference to the bread. Jesus taking the bread and giving thanks. That is in their account of the Last Supper narrative and the words of institution. So not only do we have this word being used in the Christian tradition in writings outside of the Bible, Didache, St. Ignatius of Antioch, this word is also used in reference to the Last Supper by the Gospel writers themselves. So it makes perfect sense that when John would write his Gospel, in 90 AD, and he uses this word, Eucharistin, the root being Eucharisteo, what would, have, what would have Christians called to mind? The Eucharist. Because that's how the word is used, the Last Supper that is, that's how the word is used in the Christian tradition at the time John is writing. Amen? <clears throat> Second clue that gives us an orientation to the Last Supper in this multiplication of the loaves. John's usage of the Greek word synago. You re recall, if you recall in the story, in the narrative of the multiplication of the loaves, Jesus tells the apostles to go and gather up the fragments of the five barley loaves, okay? The Greek word there for gather up is sunago. Conjugate is synagogete, but just know sunago, okay? It's from this word that synagogue Synagogue, you see the similarity there? It's from this Greek word that you get the English word synagogue because synagogue means a gathering together. All right? But here's the point. Like Eucharistin, this Greek word synago is used in the early Christian tradition in reference to the Eucharist. In that same early historical document, the Didache, here's what we read. Now about the Eucharist, there's the Eucharisteo, as this piece of bread was scattered over the hills and then was brought together and made one 
The Greek word there for being brought together, the root Greek word is sunago. And it's conjugated, as you see on the PowerPoint there, sunakthin, okay? But the root word is sunago. So notice how this Greek word is used in reference to gathering the uh, many... Uh, Let's see. Pieces of bread over the hills brought together and made one. So too let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. End quote. So in the Didache, synagogues used in reference to what? The Eucharist. At least the bread that would become Jesus Christ. Become the Eucharist. St. Clement of Rome. He writes in 90 AD, so the Didache, 70 to 90 AD, first century. Here's another historical Christian document outside of the Bible in the first century of Christianity. Clement of Rome, fourth bishop of Rome, third successor to St. Peter. He's the fourth pope. Okay, you had Peter, Linus, Anacletus, Clement. Guess what? Clement, he's mentioned by Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Linus, the second successor to Peter, is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I think it is. Clement's mentioned in Philippians 4. Now, I might be getting those Bible passages mixed up, so you might want to check me on that. But in either one of those, 2 Timothy 4, Philippians 4, Linus and Clement are mentioned. And here's what he writes. We too then should gather, Greek root word, synago, together for worship and concord and mutual trust and earnestly beseech him as it were with one mouth that we may share in his great and glorious promises, end quote. And scholars tell us that when Clement is writing here in regard to the worship, he's referring to the, early, the worship of the early Christians, the assembly on the Lord's day for the breaking of the bread. The Greek word used for the gathering, synago. Finally, St. Ignatius, once again, 107 AD, he writes in a letter to Polycarp, quote, hold services, the Greek root word, synago, more often. What services, what assembly, gathering assembly is he referring to? The breaking of the bread. So, as we've seen in the Didache, as we've seen in Pope St. Clement, as we've seen by St. Ignatius of Antioch. The Greek word synago in the early Christian tradition is used in reference to what? The breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, the Last Supper. And here's John in that same time frame, in the same Christian tradition, using synago for the gathering up of the fragments of the loaves that were multiplied. So that Greek word points us to the Eucharist. This miracle is meant to prepare us for the Last Supper. Does that make sense? So there we see a Eucharistic overtone to this multiplication of the loaves. John's dropping hints for us there to prepare us for what is to come. And Jesus is teaching about the Eucharist. Third clue, once again, looking at these Greek words. Might sound a little bit monotonous, but just to emphasize the point. John use, John's usage of the Greek word klausma in regard to the fragments. Recall, Jesus says, gather up, synago, Christian word for Eucharist. Gather up the what? Fragments. Interestingly enough, the Greek word for fragments is klausma, conjugated klasmata, but once again... This Greek word in the Didache is used in reference to the Eucharist. When it talks about the piece of the bread, the piece of the bread that's used for the Eucharist, the Greek word there for the piece of the broken bread is klasma. So like the other words, same reasoning applies. This is a Greek word in early Christian tradition that's used in reference to the fragments of the Eucharist, the pieces of the sacred host. You see? And so John uses this same word for the fragments of the multiplied loaves in the miracle, thus hinting to the Last Supper, to the Eucharist. All right? Finally, the last clue is Christ's command for the audience to sit down. Okay? Hang with me on this miracle, okay? Because once we get through this miracle, I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. Once we know that it's pointing us to the Eucharist, then we're going to ask, how does it teach us and prepare us for the Eucharist? And that's where it gets really fun, okay? So just hang with me through this one last clue here. Christ commands the apostles to sit down. Now, the Greek word that's used there for to sit down is anapason. 
or a napasin, however you want to enunciate it, anapasin. Now, what's interesting about this Greek word is anapasin is a Greek word used for a formal type of sitting, as opposed to the other Greek word for informal sitting, ekatheto. Okay, so you got anapasin used for formal sitting, ekatheto used for informal sitting, and this is used actually uh, by Saint. John, when St. John tells us that earlier in, in the Gospel of John, uh, I think chapter 6, when Jesus goes up the hill with the apostles and they just sit down and they're having a conversation, an informal, the informal word is used. Just sort of reclining back, relaxing, right? But for the sitting down in the midst of the miracle, and a patient is used. This Greek word, which signifies formal sitting, is used for liturgy at the Passover. It's the type of formal reclining that one would have at the Passover liturgy. And we actually see this word in John writing, in his writing, in his writing, uh, let's see, uh, in John, in his account of the Last Supper, when he says, so lying thus close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Remember that, that event of the Last Supper? You know, when John rests his head upon the bosom of Jesus, asking, who will betray you, Lord? The one who dips his bread and eats with me is the one who will betray me. Well, the Greek word that's used to describe this sort of reclining, this sort of lying, is anapason, same root word, Okay. So anapason signifies formal reclining, and anapason's used in reference to Passover type liturgy stuff. Amen? Okay, so follow that. Anapason, formal reclining, used for the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, signifies Passover. How does this point us to the Last Supper? Well, here we go. What we find is a pattern emerging. Because we just discovered, according to John, that anapason, formal sitting, formal reclining, that's used in reference to the Last Supper. And what was the Last Supper? Passover, right? Okay? Anapason, Last Supper, Passover. At the miracle, in the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, anapason is used within the context of the multiplication of the loaves. And guess what? Guess when this miracle happened? John tells us in John chapter 6, I think verse 4, it was the time of Passover. So you see how in both events, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the Last Supper, you have the imagery of Passover and Anapason, formal reclining. So what does this suggest to us? John is suggesting that this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves in which we have this formal Passover type reclining is meant to prepare us for the true miracle of bread that will come at the Last Supper where formal reclining takes place within the context of Passover. Do you see the pattern is the same? So if we take the miracle and the Last Supper, right? Okay, you have Anapason, Passover, miracle, Last Supper. Make the connection. Miracle is meant to point us to what? The Last Supper. The same pattern is there. So, in light of this Greek word, I think we can suggest a connection, a Eucharistic overtone here in this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. So, hopefully you can, you can see that and get that. It might take a little bit of time to meditate on that to see the connection. Now, we come to the divine pedagogy. What is it in this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves that prepares us for the Eucharist? How does it prepare us for the Eucharist? What can I learn about the Eucharist from this miracle? The answer lies in establishing the nature of the miracle that took place. And that is, the nature of the miracle, rather than saying multiplication, would more precisely be multi-location. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Carlo, are you one of these folks that says, well, you know, there really wasn't any miracle going on because everybody just kind of took out bread from their pockets and started sharing with everybody, and that was the true miracle. Are you one of these people who say, no, that's actually heresy, friends, okay? 
because that is an outright denial of the miraculous nature of the event. John is telling us and historically narrating to us what happened. And he tells us what happened was a miracle. Those, there are certain catechetical programs, certain Bible studies out there, and certain scholars who will assert that Jesus didn't do anything in regard to the bread, but everybody just kind of took it out and shared with everybody. Uh, but this is presupposes based upon a presupposition that denies the miraculous. The people who make such an assertion don't take the gospel text for what it is, for what John tells us. They're approaching the text with a preconceived idea that miracles can't happen and it's because there's a denial of the supernatural realm and the miraculous ability of God and so it's approaching the text and, say, and John says a miracle happened well John must admit something else well no we as Catholics we approach that and John says a miracle happened we say okay <laughs> amen because it's a real historical account of what Jesus did. Now, does it have theological uh, suggestions in it? Yeah, because Jesus was God, and whatever he did was a manifestation of God's power and God's plan and God's will. Amen? All right, so getting back to the event. What, am I, what do I mean by multiplication versus multilocation? Here's our clue. John tells us that when they gathered up the fragments, sunago klasmata, right? When they gathered up the fragments, they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. Did you catch that? A detail that we might miss by just reading over because we, we often hear it as multiplication, right? Because that's the subheading that uh, the, you know, the people who did the chapter divisions, etc., they put that in there. Multiplication is just a title of what it, what it is. And so we read that and we think automatically multiplication, which would imply what? You have five, you make a sixth, you make a seventh, you make an eighth, you make a ninth. But interestingly enough, John tells us that the fragments were fragments not of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bread, those breads, but the fragments of what? The five. Those same five loaves. It was fragments of those five, not a six, not a seventh. Let me read to you what a late great theologian once wrote about this. And this is where I got this idea from, or this exegesis. The late great theologian Frank J. Shee, he writes the following. It was their presence that was multiplied. The number of parts of space they occupied at the same time. I'm going to repeat that. The number of parts of spatial localities they occupied at the same time. Multi-location of loaves would be more precise than multiplication. You get it? Multi-location. Being in many different places at the same time. That means what he's referring to here is that those five pieces of bread were multi-locating. Those five pieces of bread, not a six, not a seven, not an eighth, but those five were in many different spatial localities, i.e. stomachs, at the same time. He goes on to write, It looks as if each loaf was broken into a few pieces. Each piece was nourishing one man here, and in the very same moment, nourishing another man there, and another man elsewhere, up to hundreds of men. And after all these thousands had been fed, the quantity left over was fantastically greater than when the meal began. And so, what is... What's, what he, Frank J. Sheet is suggesting is based upon this detail by John, the fragments from the five barley loaves, is that these five were multi-locating by the power of Christ. Let's take bread loaf number one. That bread loaf number one was in a thousand different stomachs at the same time. That as pieces were break, breaking off, there wasn't a multiplication of another loaf, but that same loaf being in stomach number one and stomach number two, all the way up to stomach number a thousand at the same time. Multi-locating. Bread loaf, loaf number two being in a thousand different spatial localities at the same time, multi-locating, and on and on up to bread loaf number five. That those five multi-located. Even so much that their presence and spatial reality was being multi-located, that there was more after than what began. So those five loaves in many different places at the same time. 
Amen? Does that kind of make sense? So what, what Christ is revealing to us here is that he has the power to take something of the physical realm, something of the material universe, and allow a particular material thing to exist in many different spatial localities at the same time. You follow that principle? How does that prepare us for the Eucharist, folks? That prepares us for the Eucharist because Jesus in the Eucharist is present in his body. His physical, substantial body that the Son of the Father assumed to himself, which is a part of the human nature that he took from the Blessed Virgin Mary, that body, that physical body, is present in the Eucharist, beyond the veil, behind the veil of the senses, under the appearance of bread. But his substantial body is there. And some people will ask, you see, this will help us answer the question, how can you say as a Catholic, that Jesus Christ is in the Eucharist, in his body, with his human nature, body, blood, soul, right? That's his human nature. Divinity of, applies to his divine nature. How can you say Jesus is in the Eucharist, in his body, when the Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, in majesty, in the heavenly sanctuary, in his body? How can you say he's in the Eucharist when he's in heaven, in his body? And that's a question that will often be asked to us uh, by, uh, by Protestant Christians or even Catholics who may not even understand this. The answer lies in the miracle that precedes Jesus' teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Because as Jesus can take something of the physical realm and multi-locate it, so too he can allow his body, he in his body, to multi-locate and be in many different places at the same time. Thus we can say that Jesus is present in his body in the tabernacle here at Holy Apostles while he's present in body in the heavenly sanctuary and he's present at St. Joe's across the river in that tabernacle, in his body. And not only in the tabernacle, but in every single piece of sacred host. So much so that if you have one sacred host and you break that sacred host, guess what? Jesus just multi-located. And if you break the half into another half, and you break that other half into another half, and you have, what, four-fourths, something like that? <laughs> Jesus just multi-located quadruply. And if you have the tiniest particle in that cup, in the chalice, I should say, that's Jesus multi-locating. And Jesus multi-locating, and you're, he's in you when you receive him. He's in you, he's in you, he's in you. He's multi-locating in his body. That's what the miracle of the loaves that precedes his teaching on the Eucharist is meant to teach us. Amen? Amen. And so, if you've ever asked the question, how? How can Jesus be in many different places at the same time? Is this biblical? He gives us a hint in the multiplication of the loaves. That's what the miracle is there for. That's why John puts it before the bread of life discourse. Isn't that great stuff? I remember the first time I came across this from the late great theologian Frank J. Sheed. It set me on fire. It was an amazing discovery. When I read this, I was like, wow, that's fantastic. It makes so much more sense now because I always wondered, okay, multiplication of bread, a lot of bread, Jesus gave thanks. Yeah, I see how that can prepare me for the Eucharist. No problem. But I always wondered, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something deeper. And when I discovered this in the writings of Frank J. Sheed, I think there lies the answer to that deeper meaning of the miracle. So, Jesus multi-locates. Now, this is nothing, excuse me, <laughs> that's the second time I did that tonight. There, th this is nothing new underneath the sun. We as Catholics, when we hear this stuff, multi-location, we should be used to that, amen? Can you think of anybody who multi-located, just maybe not multi, but bi-located? St. Pio! historically documented that St. Peel was in two different locations at the same time talking to two different people doing two different things. How does God allow a person to do that? I have no idea. <laughs> we'll ask him when we get there. But I can know something kind of reasonably. Now, 
this is a little bit on an elementary level. But think about it. This is one spatial locality, is it not? This is one spatial locality, is it not? This both spatial locality is distinct from that one, correct? How many persons am I? One. I'm one person, okay? My arms have extended in two distinct spatial localities, have they not? Okay, so watch this. Am I doing two... You like that, huh? <laughs> Am I doing two different things in two different spatial localities at the same time? Yeah, see, Lee got it back there, patting the head, rubbing the tummy. <laughs> he said, I got to try that one. <laughs> yeah, now, obviously, that's on an elementary level, but at least, even on a natural level, we somewhat begin to see the principle how one person can do two different things in two different spatial localities. Now, where the miracle comes in is that with St. Pio and, and some of the other saints, they were able to do two different things in two different spatial localities that were extremely far apart from one another, that went beyond the extension of their body in a spatial realm. So we see it on the natural level, it's possible, but then the miracle comes with the grandeur of it. So, folks, this is the beauty and the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. Thanks be to God, amen? that Jesus will multi-locate for us in all of our Catholic churches so that we can be with him to adore him and to love him. Okay, now, we come to John chapter 6, verses 54, 53 through 58, and the Bread of Life Discourse. Now, the Bread of Life Discourse extends before and beyond these essential text here. But this is the heart of the text, where Jesus begins to say, the bread that comes down from heaven... For the life of the world is what? My flesh. Now, just, as a, just to establish the context, something I actually learned fairly recently uh, from Dr. Brent Petrie, a renowned biblical scholar, up-and-coming biblical scholar in the Catholic world. He recently came out with a book about a year ago called The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. And one of the things he shows in this book is how in ancient Judaism, in the Jewish rabbinical tradition, there was a tradition, now we don't have to see this explicitly in scripture, although there's hints to it, but something we find in the extra biblical writings within the Jewish community and the Jewish rabbis is that they understood that the manna that the Israelites had in the wilderness, right? According to the Bible, the manna stopped when they crossed the Jordan and went into the land of Canaan. The Jewish tradition was that that manna went into the heavenly sanctuary, that manna was in heaven. And the Jewish tradition was that the Messiah would come and bring down that manna for the Messianic people. And that manna would be an everlasting bread, so to speak. All right? So this is a Jewish tradition. In first century Judaism, we find in extra biblical writings that the Messiah was supposed to bring the manna from heaven. Doesn't this make sense of why in John chapter 6... The Pharisees asked Jesus, our, Moses gave our fathers bread in the desert. What you gonna do? You see? They're testing his Messiahship. They're asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you gonna bring the manna from heaven? And then Jesus says what? Amen. I will bring the bread that comes down from, my, from heaven for the life of the world is what? My flesh. He identifies the heavenly manner that's supposed to come down in the messianic age with himself. It's his flesh. I am the bread of life, he says. And the bread that I shall give for the life of the world, and that is not the physical life, but the supernatural life, is my flesh. And then he goes on to begin commanding them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. The fundamental question is, was Jesus using this language metaphorically as an idiom, as a figure of speech? Or was he using it literally? Our Protestant brothers and sisters will assert and claim he was speaking metaphorically or symbolically, using an idiom. Not all Protestants, but the majority of them. There are some Protestants who actually believe in the real presence, but they don't have the real presence because they don't have a valid priesthood. Okay, So we've got to kind of keep them on the side there and be aware that they're there. But we as Catholics say literally, so... Who's right? Well, let's look at it. The first way that we know 
that Jesus was not using this language in a, as a figure of speech. It's in light of the crowd's understanding. The crowd, his audience, understood Jesus to be speaking literally. For example, we'll start off with the Jews. In, in verse 53... The Jews react to Jesus. When Jesus says, the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh, the Jews immediately responded, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Notice their response. Do you think they understood Jesus literally or figuratively? It makes sense to conclude literally, right? They're appalled by what Jesus just said. And so apparently they do not understand him to be speaking in a, as an idiom or in a figure of speech. So the Jews understood him literally. In verse 61, the disciples, the very people who were following Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to him teach in his ministry, they took him literally as well. For after Jesus had said six times, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the disciples say... Who can hear this? This is a hard teaching. Actually, it's reversed. This is a hard saying. Who can hear this? Based upon that reaction, it seems as if they understand him to be speaking literally, not metaphorically, because think about this. <clears throat> Let's say, for argument's sake, that Jesus used these words, eat his flesh and drink his blood, in a metaphorical way. In the Jewish tradition, it is possible to conclude that to feed upon God could possibly symbolize or be a metaphor for devouring his word, meditating upon his wisdom and his divine revelation. That theme is found in the sacred scriptures of old. So just for argument's sake, let's say Jesus meant that, that we're to eat his flesh in the sense of listening to him, devouring his word, believing in him. Follow me? Now, think about it. If that's what Jesus meant, why would the disciples have such a hard time believing that? Because they already believed it. They already were following him. They were already listening to his word. They were already meditating upon his wisdom. And so the fact that they respond appalled, how can this, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Leads me to conclude, leads us to conclude that they could not have understood him to be using a figure of speech. Because they already believed in Jesus. So they must have understood him to be speaking literally. And further, not only by their response in word, but their actions leads us to conclude that they understood him to be speaking literally. For in John chapter 6, verse 66, some translations, some translations at 67, we read, after this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. His disciples left him, folks. Why? Because he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. They said, this is a hard saying, who can accept it? Bye, see you, Jesus. And they left him. And then, Jesus turns to the twelve and says what? Will you leave me also? Remember that? So, Jesus, in a sense, um, is a, okay, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, in a sense affirming what they're doing, but we're going to come back to that. I kind of jumped ahead. So, notice, the crowds understand Jesus literally. The Jews, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? The disciples, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Bye, Jesus, see you. Based upon their responses, we know that Jesus' audience understood him literally. You follow me so far? Now, we're at a crucial moment here. Because in the dialogue, the crowd and the audience understands him literally. If, for argument's sake, Jesus would have been speaking metaphorically, what do you have here in the dialogue? If I am Jesus and you are my audience, you're understanding me literally, eat my flesh, drink my blood. But for argument's sake, I'm speaking metaphorically, what do we have? A misunderstanding, amen? Amen, huh? Now, think about this. Jesus just said, in order to get to heaven, you got to eat his flesh and drink his blood, right? He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have what? Everlasting life. Jesus is talking about how to get to heaven. If there is a misunderstanding here, 
don't you think Jesus would clarify the misunderstanding? If he's talking about something on how to get to heaven, how to be saved? So the question is this. Does Jesus correct the literal understanding of the crowd, the Jews and the disciples? Or does Jesus affirm it? The latter is correct. He affirms it. How do we know this? Because folks, right after, I love this, right after the Jews say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That would have been a perfect moment, amen, for Jesus to correct their literal understanding. Guys, come on. You got it wrong. All right, hello. This is what I mean. And go on to explain it. Okay, so, and Jesus say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Here's Jesus' response. Amen, amen, I say unto you. Right? Truly, truly, amen, amen, amen would be the proper translation. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Let me ask you something. Does that sound like he's correcting what they were thinking? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life within you. That doesn't sound like he's correcting them. Okay? Sounds like to me he's affirming them. Because they're thinking flesh, eat flesh, eat flesh. Jesus says, amen, amen. That'd be like I said to you, Jesus is God. You say, huh, what are you talking about? Amen, brother. You mean I have to worship him? Amen, brother. You mean I got to bow down before him? Give my life to him if he's God? Amen, brother. You got it right. Jesus is God. So Jesus responds, unless, uh, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink, uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Now, the Greek word for life is zoe, which is a Greek word used in reference to the divine life. In contrast to bios, which is used for like the life of the body, the physical life, and suke, which is the Greek word used for like the soulish life, the life of the soul, the, the spiritual element, okay? The immaterial element of man. Zoe is used for the divine life. So Jesus is talking about heaven here. He's talking about the divine life. And so he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. First response. You think one time's enough to affirm them? Nope, Jesus keeps going. He says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Is two times enough? No. He goes a third time. For my flesh is true food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Three times enough? No. He goes a fourth time. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Verse 57. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread, there's the sixth affirmation, will live forever in quote. Notice, folks, to the Jewish mentality, eat his flesh, how can this man say this? Jesus says, amen, amen, and speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood six times. Do you think he's correcting their literal thoughts or affirming their literal thoughts? Folks, he's affirming it, and he done it six times! just to make sure that they wouldn't get confused. So he affirms the Jews' literal thought process. Okay, well, what about the disciples? Well, after the disciples say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Jesus responds. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured it, it said to them, this is John's commentary, now here's the quote of Jesus. Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? So notice that in response to the disciples' literal thought process, Jesus appeals to his ascension. Very interesting. You scandalized by this? What if you're going to see my feet leave the ground and I'm going to disappear in the clouds? What then? Now, follow me on this. In response to the literal thoughts of his disciples, he appeals to the ascension. So apparently, the ascension can teach us something about what he just taught the apostles and the disciples. Does that make sense? Okay, follow me so far. Now, let me ask you something. Is the ascension literal or was it metaphorical? Metaphorical. 
It was literal. It was a reality, amen? So notice, in response to the literal thoughts of his audience, he appeals to his ascension, which was literal. Consequently, we were able to conclude Jesus affirms their literal thoughts by appealing to his literal ascension. That is, just as real and literal his ascension is, so too is this teaching to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Yes, this may be hard to understand, but guess what? It's going to be hard to understand how I'm going to leave the ground and disappear in your sight and go to my heavenly Father and sit at his right hand in the throne of the heavenly sanctuary. That requires faith, amen? And just as my ascension, speaking in Jesus' first person here, <laughs> just, as, just as the ascension of Jesus requires faith, so too this teaching to eat my flesh and drink my blood requires faith. So basically Jesus is challenging the audience, will you have faith in me? I've told you to eat my flesh, you don't understand how, that's okay, but will you have faith in me? Will you believe me? Will you stick it out with me even though you don't understand, Carlo? And what did they say? Bye. This is absurd to eat his flesh. How can this be? I, don't, I can't accept it. And they leave. They didn't stick it out with him to figure out how they were going to eat his flesh. So Jesus affirms the Jews' literal thought process by, by affirming it six times. Jesus affirms the disciples' literal thought process by appealing to his ascension, showing that what he's teaching does in fact require faith. And then thirdly, he affirms the disciples walking away by turning to the twelve and saying, will you go away also? By Jesus turning to the twelve and asking, will you go away? He just affirmed what everybody else who left was thinking. For example, if I say to you once again, Jesus is God, and you say, does that mean I have to bow down, worship him, and give him my life? I say, amen, brother. He said, I'm out of here. And I'm going to say, anybody else want to leave? If I say to you, the Catholic Church is the original church established by Jesus Christ. Somebody gets up and says, well, I don't believe that. I'm out of here. I say, okay, bye. Anybody else want to leave? I actually had that happen one time. I was giving a talk, and I was teaching about uh, the fullness of truth subsisting in the Catholic Church and the necessity of having scripture and tradition, etc. And I, I kind of did use some hard language in reference to one point, uh, saying how anything that contradicts truth is not of the Spirit of God. You know, it's, it doesn't come from God's spirit, amen? Because God is the spirit of truth. And I said that, and I was preaching it, you know, I was getting after it, boy. And this one lady stood up and said, Carlo, you're a heretic. And, and told all the people in the church and said, you better be careful listening to this man because he's leading you astray. She wasn't Catholic, obviously. <clears throat> and she walked out. And so I just said, I mean, I didn't say bye, but I just, I just let her go, right? I wasn't going to call her back and say, oh, well, let me explain it to you because she heard me correctly. I said what is of the truth is of the Spirit of God and what contradicts the truth is not of the Spirit of God. That's a factual statement. And she got up and left, you see. So what we can see is that by Jesus turning to the twelve, he's affirming the literal thoughts of the disciples. Amen? Okay, so the audience understands him literally. Jesus affirms their literal thoughts. And then our third clue, or our third reason why we know Jesus was speaking literally here, not metaphorically, is because there is a change in the Greek text for the verb to eat, okay? And, and here's how it goes. Before verse 54... The Greek word that's used in reference to eating, every time the word eat is used, the Greek word there is estio, okay? However, when it's conjugated, some sort of Greek stuff, which is Greek to me, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's, it, the word is estio, but it's like second aris of estio. And it, anyway, when you look in the Greek text, it looks like phago, which you see up there, okay? So that estio, conjugated as phago, used in reference to eating before verse 54 means a generic eating. Just sort of, court, you know, generic eating, just to eat. However, from verse 54 on, in the Greek text, John actually changes the Greek word 
implying that Jesus in the Aramaic must have changed some sort of wording in his response to the Jews. John changes it from STO, conjugated as Fago, to trogo. In verses 54 through 58, when Jesus says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Greek word for eat is trogo. It literally means to gnaw, to chew. It has more of this graphic connotation of eating. So notice the change in the Greek verb for eat from a generic eating to a gnawing and a chewing, chewing in order to emphasize the fact that what he said is to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And notice how the people left after the change of the Greek word. You know, rather than clarifying or correcting their literal thoughts, Jesus actually goes even stronger. <laughs> you would think Jesus would kind of put the brakes on a little bit. I know I do that often. You know, I get a little strong sometimes and I kind of back up and say, Carlo, your strong personality is coming out. Back up. You know, people tell me that all the time. You come off a little strong. And, and they tell me that. In which I, I, I understand that I do. You know, so I got to work on that in some cases. But in some cases not. But Jesus here didn't back off. <laughs> he put it in overdrive, man. In changing the wording for eat. Does that make sense? So that's our third reason why we know Jesus was not speaking metaphorically, but he was in fact speaking literally. Finally, the last reason, uh, two more reasons before we take our break, why we know Jesus was speaking literally, and this is one of the best of them all. Because in the Jewish tradition, the Jews already had a metaphorical understanding or a usage of eating flesh and drinking blood. This language was already an idiom in the Jewish tradition. You know what it meant? Persecution, destruction, assault. That's what it meant as an idiom. And here's an example. We find an example of this used as an idiom in Revelation chapter 17, verses 6 and 16. In verse 6, St. John in the book of Revelation writes, And I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Notice, John is writing about a woman being what? Drunk with the blood of the saints. Now, for those of you who've purchased the book of Revelation Bible study, here's a little sneak peek for you. You're going to learn something before you start listening to your CD set. What John is referring to here, the woman, when you do biblical exegesis of the book of Revelation, the woman is referring to Jerusalem. The harlot, you see. Jerusalem was a harlot because Jerusalem harloted with Rome denying her divine bridegroom Yahweh had made flesh, Jesus Christ, and murdered their divine bridegroom. John describes the, the Jerusalem as this woman, this harlot woman, drunk with the blood of the saints. That refers to the first century Jewish persecution where the Jews were killing off the early Christians, James the Greater being one of them, getting his head chopped off. And so to be drunk with the blood of the saints is drinking blood, this image of drinking blood, is used in the Jewish tradition as an idiom for persecution, for assault, for destruction. Further, in verse 16, St. John writes, And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. End quote. Notice the image of eating flesh. Who is the beast? What is the beast? When you do biblical exegesis of the book of Revelation, the beast from the sea refers to Rome. And John speaks of this beast devouring the flesh of the harlot, Jerusalem. What is John referring to here? He's referring to Rome when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and burnt the city down in 70 AD. This is a prophecy of the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem. This is the book of Revelation is all about. John is foreseeing this, having a prophecy and writing to the first century church to, pr to prepare them for such a destruction. And notice how John describes it. Eating the flesh of the harlot. Applying to Rome, destroying Jerusalem. So drinking blood, eating flesh in the Jewish tradition was already understood as an idiom and used as such. And what did it refer to? Destruction, assault, destruction. 
persecution. Amen? So, when we come to Jesus in the bread of life discourse, and Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, you go to heaven. If Jesus would have meant those words as an idiom or a figure of speech, in light of the Jewish tradition, what would he have meant? If you kill me, you persecute me, you destroy me, you go to heaven. You think that's what he meant? No, I don't think so. So in light of the Jewish tradition of using the language of eating flesh and drinking blood, we know that Jesus cannot be speaking metaphorically in the Bread of Life discourse. He must be speaking literally. Amen? And finally, the last reason why we know Jesus is speaking literally in the Bread of Life discourse is because Jesus commands to drink his blood. One could make the case that his command to eat his flesh could be used as a metaphor. Because in the Jewish tradition, it's often spoke of as devouring God's word, the prophet Ezekiel, right? This idea of eating God's word or eating, uh, devouring God in reference to meditating on his wisdom, soaking in his revelation type of thing, right? However, Jesus doesn't just say, eat my flesh or devour me. He says, drink my blood. Neither on the natural level, nor in the biblical Jewish tradition, is drinking blood associated with meditating on God's wisdom. Never. Never has been and it can't be. Okay? So when Jesus Christ says to drink my blood, we know that command excludes a figurative explanation. And for the Jewish mind, this is absurd. Amen? Why? Because in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, I think it is, verse 10, Leviticus 17, 10, God prohibits the drinking of blood. Why? Because God is giving the commands to the Israelites to distinguish them from the pagans who partook of the blood of the animals. Why? Because they believed the life of the animal was in the blood. And if you partake of the blood of the animal, you take on the life of the animal and the strength of the ox and the strength of the lion, etc. And God is trying to distinguish the Israelites from the pagans and so he demarcates for them this precept, do not partake of blood. Because life is in the blood. Blood was considered to be sacred. This is why blood was used in the sacrificial victims, in the sacrificial offerings to God. Blood was sacred. And here's Jesus saying, drink my blood. Something different. You see, he says, eat my flesh. That's obvious, right? Why does he say that? Because he's the what? Lamb of God. You had to eat the flesh of the lamb in order to be saved from the uh, angel of, of, of death. Right? And so Jesus says, eat my flesh, you're going to go to heaven. What does that mean? You're going to be spared of the angel of supernatural death. The devil, right? So we can see why he would say, eat my flesh. But why does he say, drink my blood? This is something that goes beyond and parts from the Passover liturgy. He is saying, drink my blood, precisely because in that blood lies the life of the divine person, the Son of the Father. The life of the Trinity. The life of God is in His blood. And we're made for that life. Amen? Consequently, we must partake of that blood. That's why Jesus Christ says, drink my blood. Because divine life lies within it. Does that make sense now? Of why Jesus would say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So, in light of this command to drink his blood, we know he is excluding any sort of figurative interpretation. So that concludes our reflection, or this biblical blueprint on the Eucharist in light of the bread of life discourse. Looking at the multiplication of the loaves, and then the bread of life discourse in John chapter 6. So we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll pick up with the words of the Last Supper. We'll go on to St. Paul's theology of the Last Supper, and I'll share with you a few quotes from the early Christian fathers, the early Christian writers about the Eucharist. Amen? Okay. Let's take a short pause for a good call. 